We are in Philippians chapter 3. As we continue our study through the book of Philippians, we are in Philippians chapter 3, and we've made it down to about verse 7 in this section. Our last lesson concerned the things in which Paul uh, did not rejoice or things that he didn't have any confidence in. Uh, We looked at earthly parentage. We looked at religious affiliation, uh, his own zeal, his own righteousness. And then we added in a couple of modern things, the power of positive thinking and, and our own accomplishments. Those were all things that we should not look to Uh, for uh, our religious state. And Paul's wish here, and so he he suffered the loss of all those things, and he did so so that he could gain something far more valuable. Paul's supreme wish is to gain or to win Christ, to be found in Christ. And the apostle tells us, Uh, what little account he made of those things. He counted all of these earthly things as rubbish, dung, filth, garbage, refuse. But those earthly things were contemptible when compared to the glories and the blessings that he had in Christ. And that was what Paul was telling us in the previous section. So now I want us to look at and go on and look at some more, uh, the continuation of this thought. He, He looks at these things and he counts them as rubbish, counts them as nothing. He sees that that all of these things of the world are nothing to him. And he says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is uh, from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So he starts this section off saying the excellency of the knowledge of, of Christ Jesus my Lord. He counts them all loss to have this personal knowledge. Notice that Paul calls it this excellency of knowledge. Well, Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 says, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, the knowledge of Christ far excels the knowledge of anything in this world. And that's important because we as humans have gotten to think that we're something special. As as humanity, we think that we're something special. And we have this knowledge of science and mathematics and business and agriculture. And well, we know how nature works now. And we, we have this list that goes on and on and on. And we think we have all the answers. And we think that we know so much God tells us, shows us that the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of God, far exceeds anything that we could have. You know, God knows that there's sickness. Not God knows that there's turmoil. God knows the problems that we face, and He still gives us the commands that He gives us because He knows better. None of these can compare to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. So we have this personal knowledge. We have this, you know, we learn, we grow. We have a personal knowledge. But then it says being found in him. A personal relationship. 
So first we see the personal knowledge, but then we see the personal relationship. Can anyone, by interrogation or investigation, determine if another person is truly in Christ? The answer is no. Of course not. 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. It is a personal belief. It is something within me, personal. Nobody else can know for sure where I stand. I may say the right things or I may say the wrong things, but nobody knows where I stand because it's a personal relationship with God. So we have to have the personal knowledge first and then we have to have the personal relationship. No one will accidentally be found in Christ. No one is found in him through change or through a selection from God. Only by our obedience to him are we put into him. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. And then by that obedience to Christ, we stay in him. 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. I have to have a personal knowledge of Christ, but then I have to have a personal relationship with Christ. And nobody else can do anything to affect that relationship. That is on me, and I have to have that relationship. And that's what Paul is telling them here in this section. But then the next set, he says, These things were gained to me that have counted loss for Christ, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And he goes on, And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but... That which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You know, the righteousness that comes through faith. This is a personal blessing that's given to us. So we have our personal knowledge. We have our personal relationship. But then there's a personal blessing. And that is the righteousness. You know, a synonym for righteousness is justification or acquittal. And when God declares one righteous, he is justified or acquitted of guilt. He is pure. God puts such a value in this this virtue, you know, the suffering of Christ, Christ shedding his blood, his death, to satisfy that relationship, to give us that relationship. Christ's death brings justification to everyone who truly believes. Uh, Romans 4, starting in verse 3, says, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Verse 4 is telling us if one worked perfectly, justification would be owed to him. But then in verse 5 it says, however, when one does not work perfectly, his faith is taken into account, just as Abraham's was. Paul here is showing that the work by itself will not justify. We have to have that righteousness given to us by God, that blessing that God gives to us. So he says, be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him. A personal knowledge, a personal acquaintance. To know God means that I have that personal relationship with him through faith and obedience. You know, we know many things about many people. We have history. You know, we can go into a history book. You know, used to, I would say you'd go to the encyclopedia and you could look up something about somebody. You don't have to go to the encyclopedia anymore. You can go to Google and type in somebody's name. 
You could read all about them. But do I have a personal acquaintance with any of them? No. I can understand their history. I can understand their likes, their dislikes. I can understand what they did, what they didn't do. But I do not have a personal acquaintance with them. So many people have a knowledge of God. They know who God is. They know his characteristics. They, they even know, may know what he expects, but they don't have a personal relationship with him. They don't have that acquaintance with him. True Christianity means I am personally acquainted with God. I know God in a personal way. I know Christ in a personal way. It means knowing intimately by experience or by devoted association, knowing him. John 17 verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, Jeremiah chapter 9 starting in verse 23 says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. We have to have a personal acquaintance with God, a personal relationship. Do you want to truly know Christ as Paul did? Or would we rather keep Christ at a safe distance? We know Christ by walking with Christ. We know Christ by obeying his will. We know Christ by glorifying his name. Paul says when he lived under the law, all he had was a set of rules. But now, along with some of those rules, he had a friend, he had a master, he had a constant companion. He had a relationship with God. But he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. A powerful occurrence that we see here. Paul desired to know the power of Christ's resurrection. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 17, says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. The power that brought Christ back from the dead is available to us as Christians. God will assist us with that same power that he used to raise Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This power of resurrection. The resurrection power went to work in Paul's life. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29, to this end I also labor striving according to his working which works in me mightily. To know God, to know Christ, and to know the power of his resurrection, to know being resurrected as a new person. But then also, here comes the next part of it, and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's a painful experience. You know, Paul desired to know the fellowship, and and think about that. Paul desired to have the fellowship of his sufferings. He desired it. Paul did not deliberately try to bring troubles upon himself. We know in Acts chapter 22, when it's talking about the shipwreck, You know, he took steps to prevent further trouble coming upon them, but he accepted sufferings that couldn't be avoided. And he looked upon it as a means of identifying with Christ. To suffer unjustly became known as the reproach of Christ, Hebrews 11 verse 26. 
Paul experienced a fellowship or a sharing in the sufferings, and we know that from multiple places, Acts chapter 9 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But Paul has revealed to us in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, he says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul says if you are right, if you are doing what God tells you to do, you are going to suffer some persecution. You're going to suffer some hardship. But in spite of all that Paul suffered, he joyed. He kept himself joyful. He kept himself rejoicing. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, this is a faithful saying, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. You know, we may have some times that are tough. We may have some things that happen to us that are tough. We may have some sufferings and some persecutions on this earth that are tough, but there will be rewards in the end. And Paul said the fellowship of his sufferings, he looked to it. But then it says being conformed to his death, a practical endeavor. You know, we are made conformable to his death when we die to sin through baptism. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 8. As Christ died for sin, we die to sin. You know, when we die with Christ, the fleshly desires, the evil passions of the flesh, they are put to death. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The world is crucified to us and we to the world. If we are truly buried with Christ, we get rid of that sin, we get rid of that that type of life, and we follow him. But then he says, verse 11, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. This was Paul's purpose regarding all of these things. Heaven is what he's talking about here. The resurrection from the dead. He's talking about heaven. It's also called the resurrection of life, John 5, 29. The resurrection of the just, Acts 24, 15. Being sons of the resurrection, Luke 20. Verses 35 and 36. You know, we understand that Paul had his sights upon this. Paul diligently wanted to obtain this goal. Romans chapter 8, he talks about that, starting in verse 19. He says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. We are looking forward to that resurrection. We are looking forward to that resurrection from the dead where we will be raised and we will be with God. Just like Paul, we can look forward to that time. You know, Paul gained far more than he lost. And in fact, the gains were so great that Paul says all the other things are garbage in comparison. No wonder Paul had joy. His life did not depend upon the things of this world. Paul's life depended upon the eternal values that he found in Christ. Paul had a spiritual mind and he looked at the things of the earth from a heavenly point of view. You know, we get caught up and we live for the things of this world. And we see all the people around us living for the things of this world and they're not happy. They're never satisfied. 
They feel like they got to constantly protect those treasures and they worry about them and they look for more and they're never satisfied. We need to turn our focus on the spiritual. And just like Paul says in these few scriptures, we have got to put our focus there and look forward to eternity. Everything we go through on this earth is worth it. We all, as we start a new year, need to do a little accounting work in our lives. And we need to evaluate what's most important to us. Are the things of this world the most important to us? Or is our relationship with God the most important thing? If there's anything we can do for you this afternoon, please come as we stand and sing.